going down life's weary road i'll try to live some travelers long i'll try to turn Till day, and I today may flowers bloom, flowers bloom along the way. My evening song, my evening song, is singing long a few more days, a few more days, and I must go. I must go to meet the deeds that I have done. I have done where there will be, there will be no setting sun, no setting sun, life's evening sun is shaking. No. And I must go to meet the deed, meet the deed that I have done, that I have done. Where there will be, where there will be no sad and shot, no sad and shot. Let the church say amen. amen. Yes, 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 the sun is sinking low, and I'm telling you, there's going to be a day uh, that you and I will not reside in this world any longer. Uh, we will no longer be concerned about the things of this earth. We won't have to worry about going to work on a Monday morning. There'll be uh, no more uh, working. Uh, we won't have to worry about uh, going to the doctor's appointment to determine whether there will be a need for further surgery or whether there will be a need for uh, more uh, medication. Uh, there'll be no more uh, need to have to get up every single uh, morning and uh, through the process of the routine that we do on a daily basis uh, in order to prepare ourselves uh, for the day. That's going to all go away, church. Uh, there'll be no reason uh, for that any longer because the sun is sinking low and at some point in time uh, we know as he ascended into the heavens he's going to descend from out of uh, the heavens and you and I are going to meet him in the air and we are going to be judged for the things that we have done on this time side of life I am uh, looking forward uh, to that day uh, when he does come back. You know what I always say, Lamentation, the third chapter, verse number 22 and 23, uh, that says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions never fail. They are great, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm so glad that we have a faithful God uh, that is a a true holder of promises. Isn't that all right, Brother Proctor? Yeah, we know that when God says, I'm going to do something, God is going to do it. It's not like a wife has uh, asked a husband, can you get this done today? And that husband says, I promise you, I'm going to get it done. Uh, uh, Brother Ragland, you know from time to time, uh, when we make those promises, uh, but boom, uh, we don't we don't necessarily always keep them. That uh, we're not as faithful uh, as we ought to be. Right. But this preacher stands before you on this day, brother Smock, to let you know that the God that we serve is a faithful God. That means we can count on Him. That means we can have confidence in Him. That means we can. Trust him. He is the God that I serve. I'm so glad that he's faithful because I've done some things, Brother Boone, uh, that uh, 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 his wrath that he has for those who are disobedient could come down on me. But 
His mercy. His mercy of the reason why I am not consumed. His compassions of the reason why I am given another chance at life. I'm telling you today that the reason why we're here is not because of the stuff that you've done. Uh, not because you got up this morning and because of your exertion, because of your energy. It was because of the almighty God that we are all present on uh, this morning it was nothing that we did he's given us another opportunity at life church he's given us another opportunity to get something right in our lives you know some sin uh, we need to repent of uh, some sin we need to confess of he's given us another opportunity for me and you to be able to tell somebody about the greatness of the son of god Amen. to be able to tell somebody about Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He's given us another opportunity to get some relationship right with somebody that we care for and somebody that we love dearly. I believe that it is because of the divine providence of the almighty God that you and I are present on this morning. Nothing that you have done has brought you to this Point. I know you put one leg in front of the other. Isn't that all right, Brother Carl uh, Raglan? I know you put your pants on this morning. You brush your teeth this morning. But everything that you did was because of the Almighty God. You remember in Acts the 17th chapter, he said, We live and we move and have our very being because of Him. Yes. He didn't say because of you, uh, He didn't say because of me. He didn't say because of my loving wife. He didn't say because of my uh, uh, handsome husband out there. You know, uh, go ahead, say amen, wise. You got some hands. Uh, 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 okay, Sister Hacker, don't say that. I understand. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but uh, we're here this morning, and we're here to praise and uplift uh, his holy uh, name. And I'm glad to see everybody out. And you're visiting with us. Uh, we want you to know the type of church we are. We're a loving church. I, I hope that has been exhibited already when you walk into this facility is that someone greeted you uh, with a smile. Someone greeted you in a kind manner. Someone said, is there anything that I can assist you with this morning or help you with this morning? How can I serve you this morning? If that's not the case, then I hope before you leave here to morning, this morning you will see that we are that kind of church. We speak what the Bible speaks. Silent, we're silent. Call Bible thing by Bible names and we do Bible thing of uh, the Bible. Away. And I hope and I trust and I pray that you will receive some type of blessing from our service this morning. Uh, I want to thank the men who participated in this morning's praise and worship to the Almighty God, uh, Brother Xavier Wallace, Brother Smocks, uh, Nathaniel Smocks, leading the song this morning. We thank them and for the scripture reading uh, that was read. We thank them for doing that. Uh, good to see that men have courage. They are courageous. They are strong they had the confidence to stand before people and do things uh, that may be somewhat out of the norm for them so we want to thank them for doing that and we uh, ask that god will continue to bestow his blessing down on them please turn your bibles to the new testament i am going to be out of the um uh new american standard version uh, this morning brother smocks new american standard uh version of the bible this morning i'm going to be in uh, Philippians, the fourth chapter, and Brother Crutchfield has been doing, uh, please do continue to pray for Brother Crutchfield. Uh, there's some therapy that he's now beginning to start. Uh, continue to keep him in your prayers as he uh, continues to uh, recuperate from uh, this injury that he had to his knee. So um, uh, he's been doing a fantastic job with Philippians on Wednesday night, and uh, uh, the preaching has been taking place from the book of Philippians as well. Uh, so we're going to begin to read at verse number one. Of Philippians the fourth chapter and we'll conclude the reading at verse number four it said therefore my beloved brethren whom I long to see my joy and crown in this way stand firm in the Lord stand firm in the Lord my beloved I urge Eudiah and I urge Sintasi to live in harmony in the Lord. Verse number three says, Indeed, true companions, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in 
the cause of the gospel, together with Clemens also and the rest of my fellow laborers or fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Church, the tag for this morning's lesson is, stand firm and rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Stand firm and rejoice in the Lord. Church, you've heard me say this several weeks in a row, and I'll, I'll say it again, that when you read or began to study the book of Philippians, uh, you know that Paul was in prison. Uh, he wrote this book around 62 AD in prison. And we know that the theme of this book, this book of Philippians, we know that it was written to the folks who were in the church at Philippi. And we know that the theme of this book had all to do with joy and rejoicing. I still, after reading uh, these uh, four chapters over and over again, I can still not fathom the love that Paul had for the church. Being in prison, being in bonds, uh, in a structure that was not allowed for him to have freedom, uh, to do whatever it was for him to do. But God left him with the ability, even in a very tough situation, to be able to mind the matters of the church, even while in prison. This book is all about joy and rejoicing while in prison. This book is all about joy and rejoicing while being in bondage. This book is all about being in joy and rejoicing in times of trouble. Are you listening to me this morning, church? Yeah. Paul wrote during a time that I just can't imagine in my mind that he would read, that he would write about joy and rejoicing. Listen, all throughout this book, there are 12 occasions throughout the book of Philippians where we read the word joy or rejoicing. If we began to read in Philippians, the first chapter, verse number four, we see the word joy. In Philippians uh, number one and eight, we see the word joy. Uh, we see rejoicing in uh, verse number 25. In Philippians, the second chapter, verse number two, we see of uh, the word joy. In Philippians, the second chapter, verse number 17 and 18, we see the word joy. In Philippians 2, 28 and 29, we see the word rejoice. When we get to Philippians, the third chapter, verse number one, Paul says, joy. And when we get to Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number one, we see the word joy. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number four. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number 10. It's all about rejoicing. It's all about having joy. Amen. Church, I find that so hard because I've been in some situations above years where I don't think I could muster up some joy. I don't think that I was able to be able to rejoice when trials came in my life, when there was terror that came in my life, when there were tribulations that came in my life, when there was trouble that came in my life. Sometimes God tested me and I didn't know how to handle those things in my life. And I'm here to tell you, being judgment day honest, that I was not one that was jumping for joy. I was not one that was rejoicing in my suffering, in my strife, in my times where nothing seems to go right. There was death to the left of me. There was chaos to the right of me. There was confusion behind me. And in front of me, there was input, a, a complexity. I didn't know what to do. The challenges that I faced, I didn't know how to do it. They were surmounting over and over and over again. And I didn't know really what to do. 
Amen. I'm here to tell you, if you're anything like me, you weren't running around jumping for joy. You weren't rejoicing in the fact that you had all this trouble. But I want you to understand on this morning, that's what Paul is saying. Paul wants us to stand firm and rejoice in the Lord. He's saying even when trouble comes, even when trials come, even when terror comes, even when you face tribulation in this life, you are to still stand firm. Are you listening to me this morning? Yes. Listen, listen, listen. Let me tell you something. That when you study this book, you uh, turn over to Philippians, the third chapter, verse number uh, 14, if you will, of those marks. And, and listen to this, church, uh, because I, I was confused somewhat uh, when I began to read this and studying this book. But I, but I figured it out uh, through some good study, good praying, good meditation over the text. Listen to what Paul said. I, I want you to understand that he's told us to stand firm. And when he said stand firm, uh, that means that we are to be unmovable. We're to be, be immovable. Uh, that means we are not wavering from uh, one side uh, to the other side. Uh, we are not mobile. It means that we are stationary. It means that we are firmly affixed. It, it means that we cannot be two places at one time. You understand what I'm saying? That's my, it means that we are fixed where we are. Right. And nothing will move us right. from where we are. But let's look what Paul said in Philippians, the third chapter, verse number 14. Read, verse 1. I press on toward the goal. Now, he says he what? Press on he toward says, the goal. I press on toward the goal. Keep reading. For the prize of the upward call. For the prize of the upward call. Of God in Jesus Christ. Of God in Jesus Christ. No, he tells us to stand firm. But then he says, press on. Mm. Yes. Amen. He says, Amen. "Press on." Uh, uh, Paul, what do you mean? Uh, you, you, I, you want us to press on, but uh, you want us to stand firm. Uh, you want us to be stationary. You want us not to move. Right. I, I don't. I'm confused, Paul. Uh, what do you mean when you tell us to press on? Uh, there's a prize that await you and I. There's a goal that I've got to meet. And there's a goal that you have to meet. So we have to stand firm in the Lord in order to reach that goal, in order to receive that prize. Am I right about it? Somebody better say amen, man. Uh, there's a goal that you and I have to obtain. And when we obtain that goal, there is a prize that awaits you and I. I I'm looking for mine. So Paul is telling us to press on, to press on toward that goal so that you and I can receive the prize. So listen, you and I got to learn how to stand firm as we move forward. Our moving forward is moving forward in the Lord. I know, come on now. The preacher's saying that, listen, Pastor Mark, you mean to tell me that I cannot progress in this secular life? You mean to tell me it's not important for me to go to school and uh, get my bachelor's degree or to get my master's degree? Maybe I want to progress and press on and move forward for the goal of mastering uh, that and be called an MD. I have my master's degree. You mean to tell me, uh, Brother uh, Wallace, that I can't uh, achieve and press on at the organization uh, that I work for. I am uh, looking for greater things. I am looking for that promotion. I am looking to be the CEO or the CFO of the organization that I am a part of. Brother Wallace, you mean to tell me that I have to put those things away and press on uh, for the prize and the goal that is in the Lord? No, I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that we got to press on for the goal to get the prize in the Lord. Amen. Listen, let's go back. Me and, me and brother, brother Hoover, just talking about this. So let's go back a few verses, back up into 19. So we know when we read verse number four, the very first word says, therefore. So uh, in order for us to understand what the therefore is, we got to go back a few verses and figure out what is Paul talking about? Why do you and I have to stand firm? 
Why do we have to stand firm in the Lord? Uh, so begin reading at verse number uh, 19. Read verse number 19 of Philippians, the third chapter. And then you'll see why we've got to stand firm and then at the same time press on uh, for the goal to receive the prize. Read. Whose end is destruction. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their appetite. Whose God is uh, their appetite. And whose glory is in their shame. And whose glory is their, in their shame. Go up one verse to verse number 18. We missed something. For many walk. Here it is. For many walk. Of whom I often told you. Who I've often told you. And now tell you even weeping. He said, I'll tell you even crying, lamenting, weeping. What? That they are the enemies that of the cross. The, what? the enemies of the cross. Say that again. The enemies of the cross. I want you to repeat it. The enemies of the cross. Say it one more time. The enemies of the cross. They are the enemies of the cross. Are you listening to me, church? That's the reason why you and I have to learn to stand firm and press on at the same time because there are enemies of the cross Amen. and the enemies of the cross if you keep reading the verse number 19 they mind the things that are earthly That's right. they mind the things that are temporal they mind the things that go away they mind the things that evaporate they mind the things that minimize Instead of minding the things that are increasingly building up, they don't mind the eternal. They don't mind the heavenly. And when you begin to mind the earthly, and when you begin to mind the temporal, then you put everything that's heavenly and everything that's uh, uh, eternal on the back burner. That's what happened. And I, I keep, you know, I'm not going to be the dead horse with that. But I got to go back to it because Paul said, therefore. We got to understand what the therefore was for. It was for the fact for us to be able to stand firm and press on at the same time and remembering you and I cannot mind the things of this earth because the things of this earth are temporal things which mean they go away. Right. Right. We are eternal beings. We are heavenly being because he said to, to our citizenship is where? In heaven. In heaven. Yes. Our citizenship is in heaven. Why would your citizenship be in heaven and you are minding the things of the earth? The temporal thing. The things that go away. I talked about this already. So I'm not going to beat a dead heart. So we're going to move on. But, but, but I will say this. Things that pertain to minding the heavenly and the eternal should never be placed on the back burner. Amen. Not ever. Amen. Not ever. If you don't put kingdom building built business at the top of your list of things that are important, you, the hierarchy of things that are important in my life, it ought to have Christ first in everything else beyond that or below that. That's how it ought to look if you're minding the things that are eternal and heavenly. Because I'm a citizen. I'm a citizen right now Amen. of heaven. Right now. Because there is now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but who walk after the spirit. Romans the 8th chapter, verse number 1. So I'm not trying to get to heaven. I'm already there, Brother Proctor. Amen. <laughs> So, uh, Brother Smart, if you would, go back to Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number one. And, and, and if you will, uh, read. Therefore, my beloved. He said, therefore. My beloved brother. My beloved brother. And Paul was talking to the people that he had a relationship with. Uh, people that he uh, cared for. He, he called them beloved. Uh, he called them brethren. Uh, meaning that he had a relationship with them and that he 
uh, love them. Remember what I said? How could it be that man was in prison, but he still had a, such an affectionate care uh, for the church, even though he was nowhere there? Because it was smart to read on. You understand that. But can you read? Whom I long to he, see. He said, who I'm, I long to see. I, I want to see you all so bad, but because I can't see you, I'm writing you this letter to encourage you while I'm in prison. To encourage you while I'm in prison. Generally, I go right in this other way around. If you know somebody that's in prison, you write them letters to encourage them. But Paul is in prison, and Paul is the one doing the writing to the church of Philippi to encourage them to remain joyful and rejoice in the Lord. Meaning, I know that despite everything that wrong that happens in my life, everything that the world will see as a moment for me to cry and to weep and to lament and to give up and throw my hands up and say I'm confused and don't want to move on or the time when I jump for joy. I rejoice in the fact that those things have happened because I don't waver. Amen. It never wavers. Amen. My relationship with him will not waver. Amen. I press on for the prize. Yeah. I keep going Amen. for the goal yeah. because I understand that I am a citizen of heaven, yes. not in yes. the future, but right now. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yes. I don't waver when things happen. Let me give you an illustration. This is the funniest thing ever. Anytime me and my wife will go to a fast food joint, and my son knows this too, in the drive through y'all know this too. You order, and your order is Never right. Never right. So we went yesterday uh, uh, to one of the uh, establishments, one of these fast food establishments, and uh, we ordered, and guess what? It went right. And I said, you know what? I have learned to do this. To rejoice <laughs> into joy in the fact that I at least got something to eat. Right. It may not be what I wanted to eat, right. but it was something that filled my belly. And then here's the, here's the great thing about it. I could really joy and really rejoice when they got it right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. We got a reason always to rejoice. I'm not going to argue anymore. I'm not going to fret anymore. I'm not going to fuss anymore over the fact that I asked for Dr. Pepper and I got Coke. I'm still going to rejoice in the fact that I get to quench my thirst, brother fears. I'm drinking Coke instead of Dr. Pepper, but I'm rejoicing. Isn't that all right? And so, so that's what we got to learn. So, so uh, verse number one, if you keep on reading verse number one again, brother, verse my. My joy and crown. My joy and my crown. Crown, watch this, is in who? In this way, stand firm in the Lord. In this way, stand firm in the Lord. My beloved. My beloved. Church, we got to learn how to stand. Amen. We have to learn how to stand. You and I are going to get up each and every morning if the Lord say the same. And we got to learn to stand firm in a chaotic world. Did you hear what I said? We live in a chaotic world, a chaotic time. There's ruckus and there's rampus going on in our political arena of our country. You see it every day. Nobody, you don't, uh, nobody's ignorant to that. Uh, all you got to do is turn your phone on and your alerts will show you. And the first thing you will see is generally always something about what's going on in this country politically. There's chaos. But guess what we got to continue to do? Stand firm. We got to continue to stand firm. Regardless of who's there, regardless of what the who there will do or not do, you and I have to stand firm. What are we standing firm on doing? Press it on. Toward the prize. 
That's what it is. We keep moving regardless of the situation. Listen, 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 listen. Kids my son's age are coming up missing all over this country. Never to be seen nor heard from again. I'm constantly talking to them about always being aware of your surroundings. Always looking at the people, even the ones that so call themselves to be your friends. Because sometimes your friends will take you places that you don't want to go. You don't need to go. Things are happening. And I'm constantly talking to them. Even with the things and the decisions that they make, Brother Ragman, that you make the best decision. You make the right decision. I'm teaching them reasoning skills, meaning they understand that for every action, there is a what? A reaction. They must understand that. Because we live in a chaotic world where our children are coming up missing on a daily basis and they are never to be seen again. This is the world that we live in. And if something happened to one of my children, even in that chaotic situation, I've got to stand firm and keep on pressing on. I know that's hard. But boom, that would probably be the one of the hardest thing that any person could ever live through. But you still have to stand firm and you stand firm in the Lord. Right. Knowing that I'm not going to waver because he never wavers. Right. His promises are solid. Right. Right. Promises are solid. Amen. So look at verse number, number two, if you don't mind. Of course, you'll read that for me. It's all good. I urge I the smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I urge Eudodia uh -huh. and I urge Sin uh -huh. Sint Chi uh -huh. to live in harmony in the Lord. To live where? In harmony in the Lord. To live in harmony in the Lord. Go ahead and read verse number three with that as well. Indeed, true companion. And be true companion. I ask you also to help these women to who have shared. Women. My struggle in the cause of the gospel. Uh huh. In the cause of the gospel. Keep reading, Clement. Together with Clement also, uh huh. And the rest of my fellow workers. Fellow workers. Whose names are in the book of life. Whose names are in the book of life. There are going to be times when things are going to happen in the church. And in the church, when things happen, you and I have got to learn that. We are companions together. That's right. We are fellow workers, or as the King James Version would say, fellow laborers together. Uh, first Corinthians, the uh, 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 first chapter, verse number 10. We are uh, fellow laborers together. And do you realize that we cannot accomplish anything if there's ruckus? If that's rampus, if that's chaos. Uh, listen, I heard an old gospel preacher years ago say, if there's fighting, there's no fishing. So if there's fighting in the church, the focus is on what's going on in the church, and there is no fishing when Jesus said he called us to be fishermen right. of men. Right. Yeah, when chaos happens, uh, evangelism takes a back seat to all that chaos. Hey, you ever notice when there are issues in the church, something's going on, uh, your Sunday morning services will uh, be at a certain capacity, but when there's a Saturday meeting about the chaos and the rucking, ruckus, your Saturday me meeting will, will outdo your attendance on that Sunday. There are more people that are concerned about the fight than they are concerned about the fishing. Uh, so, so we have to learn to work in harmony together. We have to work in concord with each other. Uh, so that means that we have to set aside our pettiness, set aside our an animosities, mm -hmm. put that stuff behind us, and work together to move forward. And, I, and what gets me is he said, true 
companion. And, and see, I understand the opposite of true is false. Uh, there are some folks who are fake, false, and phony who are in the church. Because remember, uh, it, Paul calls them dogs. He calls them evil workers. Y'all remember that? In Philippians, I believe that was uh, 2 and uh, 18. He calls them 2 and 17 or 2 through 19. He calls them dogs. Uh, they are evil uh, workers. Uh, he also called uh, them enemies of the cross of Christ. Uh, they work against the efforts of the church. Uh, see, when fellow workers are together, fellow companions are together, uh, it comes, uh, fellow workers come from the Greek word, which is a suna, sunagos. Uh, the phonetic spelling word is S-O-O-N-E-R-G-O-S, a sunagos. And sunagos is where we get our word synergy from, a synergy. And what synergy means is that uh, there are a combined effort of corporations or organizations or substance who realize that the efforts together will bring out a greater cause of effect if they work together. Uh, so uh, it, it's a it's it's a business word word, and and many of you may know that word if you are in business. You know that uh, if you work. Uh, for a certain department. You may work in this department. There's a meeting where every single department comes together. Uh, development comes, uh, the designers uh, come, finances come, because see, finance got to say how much money you can be able to spend on this uh, project. Everybody is involved in making a greater effort of whatever they are trying to accomplish. Uh, look, wouldn't it be wonderful if the preachers and the elders actually did get along. There was some synergy amongst the preachers and the elders and they really got along for the purpose of kingdom building business. Wouldn't it be great if there were some deacons and elders and preachers that worked together for synergy for the purpose of broadening the borders of the kingdom of God? Wouldn't it be wonderful if the people in the pews and the preachers and the deacons and the elders all work together in a synergized way to bring souls to Christ. That's what he means when he talks about fellow laborers, fellow workers who are united together for the purpose of bringing souls to Christ. Nothing else just bringing souls to Christ. That's what Paul is talking about. Then, read verse number three again, but I want you to read verse number four uh, with it as well. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse, oh, I, well, I, I tell, I'm so sorry. I had you go to 1 Corinthians, the uh, first chapter, verse number 10, of the reason why I had you go there, because I, I want you to know that there should not be any division amongst us. There should not be, uh, read what Paul uh, told the church at uh, uh, Corinth. Read what he said. Now, I, I exhort you, brethren. He said, I exhort you, brethren. By the name of our Lord Jesus by the name Christ. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that you all agree. That you all do what? Agree. Agree. And there be no divisions and among you. And there be no what? Divisions among you. Division amongst you because? But that you all be made complete. That you all be made complete. In the same mind. In the what? Same mind. In the same mind. And in the same judgment. And in the same judgment. That's what Paul told the church at Corinth. You and I cannot move forward if I'm rowing one way and you rowing the other way in a boat. It just does not work. Am I right about that, Brother Proctor? It just does not work. We have to learn to work together. We have to learn that God gave this man a spiritual gift, a talent, a skill different from that man's gifts and skill and talent. But each one of those gifts and skills and talent can come together and be used as a united force to broaden the borders of the kingdom of God to help bring those who are lost into the light of marvelous. That's, right. That's what the purpose of that is for. That's why I'm a saint. That's why you're saints. 
We are set apart. Oh my goodness. Amen. You are set apart. To do something different. Do, do we understand that? A, 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 a saint is someone who is sanctified, who's set apart to do something different from what the world does. Amen. The world is not out there telling folks about Jesus. The world is not out there saying you need to come to Christ. The world is not out there talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. The world is not out there. Talking about Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse number 13 through 18, about the church that you can read about in the Bible. The world is not out there talking about a First uh, Corinthians, the 6th chapter, uh, verse number 9 through uh, 13, about a uh, fornication. They're not talking about adultery. Uh, they're not talking about uh, homosexuality. They're not talking about covetousness. They're not talking about drunkenness. They're not talking about lying. They're not talking about uh, 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 all of this uh, stuff that the world does. The world is not going to do that. We've got to do it. Right. That's how we're going to bring people to Christ. We uplift him and put ourselves down. Right. Right. We've got to mind the things that are heavenly and mind the things that are earthly. How do we do that? We have to be transformed. Uh, you remember in one of the 12th chapter of verse number two, it said that we ought to, uh, to conform, not to conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our what? Mind. We've got to have the mind of Christ. And if you and I are set apart, if we're sanctified, if we're holy, we ought to have the mind of Christ and be able to take our mind and put it away. Everybody made a decision to do that? Oh my goodness. We too busy minding the things of the earth. We too busy minding the temporal things. We too busy putting our schedules together and putting uh, God, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, F, somewhere down at the, toward the end of the alphabets. Uh, if we counted from one to 100, God ain't, ain't even in our top five. He ain't even in the top 10. He don't make the top 20 list. Everything else makes the top 20 list. Uh, God don't even make the top five. Oh, we listen to that, church? So, so, so uh, read verse number three and four, and we're going to close. Read verse number three and four of our text together, Philippians, the fourth chapter. Mm -hmm. Indeed, true companion. Yeah, true I companion. ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the uh -huh. cause of the gospel uh -huh. together with Clement, also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Whose names are in the book of life. Now read verse number four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Do what? Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will Lord say always. rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Listen. <laughs> Here's the great thing. Paul said their names were written in the book of life. Amen. Things are going to happen in the church. And I said it. It, it happens all the time. It, it, it's a part of life. Uh, if you ever think the church is ever going to be perfect, then, uh, boy, that's a bad thought that you have because it's not. There's always going to be something that's going on in the church that is going to require uh, the attention of all of us. And you know what that you, you know what that means? That that's a growing church. That's a growing church. It, it, we talked about uh, 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 a uh, um, undertaker church. Remember we discussed what an undertaker church was? And that's a church that's dying. Uh, there's no growth. Uh, it's joy and congregation has been around for a while. The members are uh, are older members. There is no evangelistic effort. Uh, there is no visitors. It's a church that's in rapid decline and subject to closing their doors at any time. And then there's the caretaker church. Remember when we spoke about the caretaker church? A caretaker church is a church that uh, sticks to the status quo. They say, this is what we've always done. Uh, this is how it used to work. Well, I'm here to tell you things that worked 10 years ago. I'm telling you, don't work right now. Right. Uh, look at the 
look at the, 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 the rapid speed of advancement in technology. Everything is changing right before our eyes. What used to be good is no longer good. It's obsolete. A caretaker church is the one that says uh, they, they live off their past. Their past is their hero. They always talk about what we used to do. We were the fastest growing church in the 60s and 70s, and we did this and that. Doing this and that in the 60s and 70s was good. Doing this and that in the century we live in is not good. I'm not saying you put it away totally, but you got to progress right along with the progression. And then there's the risk taker church, which is what we want to be. A risk taker church is that a church that kind of does things out of the ordinary. Uh, they don't ask the leading brothers in the brotherhood permission to do it. Uh, they just do it uh, because they see it's, necessi it's a necessity for the community. It's a necessity for the growth of the church or uh, for the development and the strength and the maturity of the church. Uh, so they just, uh, they just uh, do it. Uh, they don't wait for somebody to tell them uh, that they're wrong. Uh, these uh, churches are the ones that are constantly moving. There is no such thing as a bad idea. Uh, anybody can bring an idea and every idea will be considered. Not that every idea is gonna be done, but every idea should be considered. That's a risk-taking church. And that's the kind of church that we have to be. We've got to learn to take the risk and do those things which are somewhat uncomfortable. A risk-taking church is a church that have learned, they have learned to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. We don't change the doctrine. We change the methodology. That's all. That's all we do. So, so we've got to be a type of church where we know and understand that even in chaotic situation, even when there's ruckus and rampants in the church, we got to know that's good and still understand that brother and that sister's name is still written in the book of life. Everybody didn't come into church perfect. Jesus said he came not to save the righteous, but the unrighteous. And, and I think every last one of us before we got into church that you can read about in the Bible was in some sense unrighteous. Yeah. So he came to save us. Uh, so I don't have a problem with chaos. I don't have a problem with ruckus. I, I, I don't have a problem with struggles. I don't have a problem with challenges in the church because that gives me an opportunity to teach and an opportunity to preach and an opportunity for us to engage in, in harmony, in concord. And as we go together, my co-laborers, my fellow laborers, my uh, 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 folks who are involved in the uh, synergy uh, the efforts to collaborate with everybody here with your skill, your talent, your spiritual gift to broaden the borders of the kingdom of God. I just want us to be an evangelistic minded church where we don't mind the things that are temporarily, but we are minding the things that are heavenly and eternal. And when you do that, you are standing firm and rejoice in the Lord. Because verse number four, read it again. Paul says, what to the church? Rejoice in the Lord always. He says, rejoice in the, uh, in the Lord when? Always. Say it again. Always. And then? Again, and I will say, rejoice. Rejoice. Always rejoice in the Lord. Don't matter what's going on. Rejoice in the Lord. Chaos in your house. Rejoice in the Lord. Trouble you facing, rejoice in the Lord. Ruckus in the church, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. 
joy in the fact that your salvation is sure and that you and I are citizens of heaven. Amen. Our citizenship is in heaven. Paul said, uh, turn to, turn to, uh, turn to uh, Philippians 2 and 2. Paul said, because of this, it brought joy to him. Right. It brought joy to him. Remember, in prison, read what he says in, in, in Philippians 2 and 2. Make my joy complete. He said, make my joy complete. By being of the same mind. By being of the what? Same mind. Being of the same mind. Maintaining the same love. Maintain the same love. United in spirit. United in spirit. Intent on one purpose. Intent on one purpose. How could the church miss that? He's saying, I'm going to receive the joy because I see you united together for one purpose in love. How do we miss that? How do we miss that throughout the entirety of the brotherhood? Paul's in prison. And he said, I just want some joy. And that joy is to see you all working together, united for common purpose in love. Stand firm and rejoice in the Lord. You've heard the word of God on today. Maybe there's someone here that needs to repent of a sin, need to confess a fault, or maybe there's someone here today that just needs prayer. I, I tell you, I always stand in the need of prayer. Yeah. Uh, Sister Holliman, I need prayer all of the time. I, I stand in the need of prayer. And that's why the Bible says in James, the fifth chapter, verse number 15, confess your faults one to another, that you be healed. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avail it much. I need somebody to pray for me like I need to be praying for somebody else as well. Amen. We need to be praying for one another. We need to exhort each other to lift each other up. That's the purpose of us being together. That's the purpose of you being a cold fellow worker that's the reason why we are fellow workers together we labor together so somebody may need to pray somebody may be outside of the body of Christ on this morning and that's not a safe place to be the preacher wants to tell you that because that's what the word of God said and I want you to know that the Bible is right and the Bible is the word of God but he got but in the word of God he gives us a remedy to our situation first thing we got to hear we got to hear the word. The Bible says in Romans the 10th chapter, verse number 17, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by uh, the word of God. Hebrews 11 chapter, verse number 6 says, without faith is it impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on that cross, according to uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse number 1 through 4, uh, that he was buried, that he arose, and he sits on the right-hand side of the Father right now as we speak. You got to believe that. Then you got to repent of your sins, according to Luke, the 13th chapter, verse number 3, where the Bible says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Uh, we got to say no to some of the thing, to the things that we're doing that are unrighteous and move to the things that are righteous. Yeah. Then we have to confess the sweetest name that ever rolled off mortal tongue. We uh, no differently than the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts the eighth chapter, verse number twenty six through forty. And, and the uh, 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 Philip said, uh, "Do you believe?" He said, "I believe that Jesus Christ." is the son of God. They both went down into the water, which is the final step, uh, baptism. I don't care what the television evangelists say, uh, Brother Raglan, I don't care uh, what the radio evangelists say, uh, that all you got to do is raise your hand, confess his name, confess with your lips, and Jesus Christ will come into your heart. Uh, that's not in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Bible. But I do read in Mark 16 and 16, he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
on the day of Pentecost in Acts the second chapter, verse number 37 and 38, they, the, the crowd uh, hollered out to Peter and to the arrest of the apostle, men and brethren, what shall we do after they learned that they had just crucified the Messiah, they had just crucified Emmanuel, the savior of the world, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If that's not enough for you to convince you, Peter went on to say in 1 Peter, the third chapter, verse number 21, baptism now do save us. Then you got to live faithfully into death. According to Revelation, the second chapter, verse number 10. That's what one has to do in order to be in the kingdom of God. A church that you can read about in the Bible. According to Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse number 13 through 19. You've heard the word of God on today. Why don't you come as we stand and sing the Savior's song of invitation. I really love the Lord.